Um, I'm Gavin Bell. Uh, I work at the Nature Publishing Group, um, which is part of Macmillan, based in London. Um, Nature is obviously the scientific journal that I hope you've heard of. Um, over the last year or so, I've been looking at scientific identity and what that means in terms of how scientists can get to know one another. So if you've never met a scientist and you get an online reference to them, how do you know what that scientist has done? How do you know what their, uh, as I like to call it, their provenance is? And in science, that's often done through published papers. So with scientists, we've got quite a good way of getting a context for one another through these, these publications. And within the social network system that we've created, um, we also track conversations that scientists have had with one another and the kind of things that they've talked about, the tags they've used, that kind of thing. So I started thinking about what that would mean in terms of the rest of the internet. How would we know um, an individual if we met them and all we, had, all we knew about them was an email address or a URL? So this is kind of a, a loosely formed experiment, exploring the kind of the slower aspects of um, our identity. So not necessarily the stuff that comes directly from RSS feeds, but the kind of, uh, how do you know that I talk about provenance? Well, you might look at some blog posts, but how can you tell that in aggregate just from a URL? So do we have, and answering the question of, do we have a consistent identity that exists on the, on the internet? Um, and also looking at the content we make and the social relationships we have. But one of the first questions people ask me um, is, what on earth is provenance? Because it seems like a slightly old word. Um, so provenance, this is, uh, I gave this talk at um, the XTech conference in Paris about a month ago. Um, and this, was, this is a really poor quality mobile phone picture uh, in a restaurant um, showing that the, the provenance of the meat sold in this restaurant um, comes from PayPal, which is Holland, France, and Germany. So that's saying that the, the restaurateur vouches this meat to come from these countries. Um, but provenance also has kind of a deeper meaning than that. It's often used in antiques. Um, so you only buy um, an antique from another dealer um, if you can get the paperwork, if you can know that this thing really is an 18th century French um, table. Um, and so I think people also have a provenance. Um, the web's about people, despite the focus on pages. And people create content. And people, people kind of, pages are interesting because they have information on them. But the, most, the best way to get uh, a piece of information is if someone gives you a reference. This article's really good. Or go and look at what this guy has written. Um, stuff that comes back from a search engine, you don't know whether to trust it or not. So slightly different view of provenance. Um, does anybody know what these are? No? OK. Um, they're my ducks. When I was about six or seven, um, these were in my granny's house. And they're actually Burmese opium whites. And so I have the provenance for these is I know that my grandparents owned them. Um, I know that my great grandfather bought them in Burma when he was doing oil exploration there because I have the piece of paper that shows the, you know, how much he paid for it and the fact that uh, an antique dealer vouched for them that they were authentic from 1850 or something like that. So that's, kind of, that's what provenance is. <sighs> Change of topic slightly. Identity, I think, is really important. Um, we care a lot about who people are. And so running through this, writing this talk, and thinking about stuff at Nature, um, I've been thinking about what happens 10 years from now. How do we know about the people who existed now? How do we know about the people who will exist in the future? Um, what kind of devices will we use to establish identity? Will everything go on to iPhone or N95-like devices? Um, how will we, if we're using those devices to navigate the internet, that's a really strong personal tie between me and the stuff I look at. Much, more strong, much stronger than this laptop, which is mine and I use alone. But a phone is a really strong tie to my identity. Um, so identities change quite a lot over the last kind of few hundred years. Um, about three or four hundred years ago, uh, we started getting surnames. So Bell and Butcher and things like that were surnames based on the profession of people. About 20 years ago, it was a postal address and a fixed line phone number. That was how we knew who someone was. Then email, mobiles, and websites arrived. So what we are, def what we are defined by is changing as more of our existence becomes digital. More and more of our lives are available at a distance from us. Much more of me lives on the internet um, and is visible on the internet. So um, in this kind of quest, let's start with a person. So this is me. Um, and I set off on a little quest to try and prove my own provenance. 
So let's start with some facts. I'm 35, I'm married, I've got a son called Oscar, I work for Nature, as I've said. So what else can we find out about me online? Well, if you Google around, um, if you use a Google or search engine, to be correct, probably, um, you can find these little identifiers. These represent me on various different social software services. They're kind of monikers for me. Um, depends when I arrive on the site. If I get in early, I might be Gavin. If I get in a bit later, then I might be ZZ Gavin. Um, take One Onion is the name of my blog, so some of my stuff's based on that. Um, and sometimes I'm Gavin Bell. It depends how formally I want to be known. But that's actually who I am. I'm not those identifiers and these URLs. These are unique spaces on the internet that I own. So the Tumblr log, those pages on Delicious, um, the stuff I've created on Freebase, um, the photographs I've stuck on Flickr. These URLs represent me. They're sources of content that I have created. So I think our existence is quite distributed. Um, I exist on 20, 30 different websites. I'm referenced by lots of other different websites. Um, but all of this is kind of connected together. And so a question I had was, how easy is it to tie all of this stuff together? Um, and in researching this, quite a few people, Simon Wilson, who I think is talking here on Monday in particular, said, well, OpenID might solve a lot of this. And it kind of does. It kind of helps. It gets you to the point where you can prove that you are the person or the sequence of keystrokes which owns the URL that's being pointed at to these other services. Um, but because it's authentication only, it doesn't solve the complete problem. And I think OpenID, the OpenID project, took a really good run at this in that they solved the, the unique small problem that was out there to be solved. And they didn't solve the whole thing. They let people build on top of that. So. Um, I think because of the way OpenID allows authentication, and authentication includes a URL, OpenID puts a representation of myself online. Um, usually there's an H card on that OpenID page, and quite often that H card has an exciting thing, rel equals me wrapped around various links on it. So that ties my identity to these other pages, so it connects me to, say, my Flickr pages. Um, so this is, none of this is radically new. Um, this has been talked about uh, in terms of the XFN microformat for quite a while. But let's expand, let's expand on this a little bit. Um, who do we know? Well, I know quite a lot of people online. Um, I have lots of contacts on social networking sites. I have people who come and comment on my own weblog. Um, I have AIM buddies. Uh, all of these people have their own personal websites. They're all connected to other people in social networks. And all of these social networks tend to point at personal pages or home pages which represent them. So if we follow these backlinks, we can start building a network of my friends and the things that they say they own. Um, so we can work out, so we have a page which says, this is who I am. Uh, we have other pages which declare who my friends are. And we have a means of connecting these together through these different social networks. Um, there's a mathematical proof done by the people doing uh, research into OWL that says that, if, uh, which I can never remember the fine detail of the proof, but essentially it says that if a page is pointed at, if two pages are pointed at through different routes, and one page says that this page is owned by someone, and the page points at something else, there's a mathematical proof that shows the page which isn't pointed at is actually part of the same loop. That was really poorly explained. I'm sorry about that. Um, so I started looking at machine traversal of my own personal social network across multiple social networks, trying to connect together my content and the people who I know. So I make a bunch of stuff. I write, I take pictures, I tag things, I reply to stuff, I make posts on my own blog uh, and in other spaces. Can we sum this output up? Well, yes, in terms of tags. So we don't want to have the whole weight of the content we want to be able to summarize this so we can get a picture of myself and my friends. So we can sum this up in terms of tags. We can sum it up in terms of locations, um, in terms of photos via tags. We can get automatic text summaries of written output. And in terms of music that I listen to, we can look at Last.fm. We can look at Doppler in terms of places that I visit and places I'm going to. This is all web-shaped da web data, as Matt Bidoff likes to describe it. Um, and so. I started thinking about the internet as a single social network. This is a nice quote from uh, it's a guy called Gary McGraw, uh, echoing 
Ben Smith's 1991 observation about uh, how the internet works. People keep asking me to join the LinkedIn network, he said, but I'm really part of a network. It's called the internet. Um, ben Smith in 1991 so was talking about office email systems and how eventually, one person, eventually people would realize that they were part of a whole network of email. And 16, 17 years later, no one would think about separate office email systems connected together. There's just email. It connects people together on the internet. Um, so we have interconnected people with content-specific repositories helpfully tagged up with metadata. And we have ways of machine traversing that. But tags aren't as simple as they sound. Tags are individually created labels for items of content. They're inherently personal. I put a tag on a piece of content so I can remember what it is. I'm summarizing it for myself. They're intentional quite often. So you know, I might tag something with to read, or uh, I might tag it so that someone else can pick it up. To City of Sound, for example, um, a friend of mine on Delicious. Um, everybody has a different point of view when they're using tags. They might have the same word. Uh, so I was at a uh, publishing conference recently. When they talk about library, they mean bricks and mortar buildings with lots and lots of books. When you guys talk about library, I'm sure you mean Ruby and PHP code libraries. Um, so this can lead to a kind of uh, a fragmentation of understanding. The tag on its own isn't meaningful. You need to know who has done the act of tagging for it to become a meaningful uh, piece of information for you. So there is a flip side to this. This is something we're, def we're exploring inside nature. Um, if you can understand someone else's tags, then maybe you can use those tags to give you an insight into a different scientific discipline. This is how lots and lots of people win Nobel Prizes. They go and look at another area of science, and they come back and apply that to their own area. Um, Gregory Perlman's uh, won and uh, turned down the Fields Medal recently by looking at thermodynamics and applying it to topology. Um, so uh, Ruby is another good example. Ruby means a color. It means a gemstone. It's a song by the Kaiser Chiefs. Um, depending on who you are, um, that word has different meanings. And the, the song Ruby, Ruby, Ruby by the Kaiser Chiefs is talked about on Ruby mailing lists as a kind of piece of amusement. And we are smart enough to differentiate between the usage of Ruby referring to the song by the Kaiser Chiefs and the general usage of, of Ruby on the mailing list referring to the programming language. How can we teach our computers to be this smart? Or how can we give enough evidence, enough context to people browsing sites that we make that, uh, so that they can infer the context from what's being shown? So the crux of this is kind of, can I sum the output of my friends to work out who knows what about what? Um, and can I move to a level where I'm sort of managing people and not managing feeds? Um, this is kind of an attention hack. Um, my feed reader, I'm sure, like yours, has got hundreds of feeds in it. I don't read most of them. Um, my machine busily updates them, and I read 20 or 30 of them. But there will be things I'd like to keep in touch with, but on a kind of longer form basis. Friends who I want to keep up with, but I don't want to read every blog post they've written. So um, I think we tend to make queries which are people-driven. Um, we're not necessarily looking for a link to a page. We're looking for an answer to a problem or we're looking for a certain piece of information that we can use in another context. Um, we did some research in nature, and we found that about 80% of people would rather um, a recommended paper to one find through a search engine. And they trust a recommended paper substantially more as well. Um, so Google returns pages, not people or techniques. Um, so does Yahoo. All the search engines return, return pages. Um, but people-based queries are much more sort of fine-grained. Um, do you know John? On which John do you mean? Um, these things are much more complex and much harder to enter into a simple search box. I'm preaching to the converted here. I'm sure you know this. but um, So we have these kind of micro queries, which are really contextual. Show me a good restaurant. Um, harder things like, um, would Simon be a good speaker at this conference? I don't know. Have you seen him speak before? What was he like? He was quite good. Uh, how do you get that kind of stuff out? Well, there'll be blog posts that mention Simon or John or Fred speaking at a conference. But will they talk about his delivery? Will they talk about how nervous he was? Will they talk about the quality of his presentation? Probably. Can you abstract that out? Um, these are kind of things you'd ask friends, sort of implicit knowledge. Um, an example I've got is the wine site, Corked. Can I find a decent wine by searching on the internet? No. Can I find a decent wine by looking up? What my friends drink in court? Yes. 
So the kind of the content that people are labeling and the, con the relationship between people and that content is, re is really rich and important. So search is only so helpful. Um, I want to know about astrophysics. This is actually a real world example. So a colleague of mine, Ian Mulvaney, is an astrophysicist. I'd like to write science fiction sometime. And it's completely geeky, isn't it? Um, and I asked Ian, after searching around on different search engines, to find out about astrophysics and looking on Amazon to find out about astrophysics. And he ended up writing a two and a half page email saying, read this book, read this paper, have a look at this thesis I wrote. And now I have a package of about six months worth of reading that will take me up to kind of undergraduate level in certain strands of astrophysics. How do I get that kind of package of information out of the internet? Or how do I find the right person to go and talk to? Um, so Simon, who I've talked about a bit, Simon Wilson. Simon knows a lot about OpenID. How can I tell this? It's quite a hard thing to answer. Um, and he, how do I know he's actually the best person to ask about OpenID amongst my friends? And how can I get my computer to tell me this? Those are questions that are running through my head. This talk's not really about answers. I'm just trying to raise questions in your head, really. So quick demo now. Um, OK, and a quick demo and a quick admission. Um, I write really poor code. I don't write code for a living. I draw big boxes. I'm a, I design social software. Um, so in the space of about 10 days, uh, kind of end of May, I set myself a task to uh, pick up Ruby again, find the right tools, and work out if I could write um, a loose screen scraper to prove my point that I've tried to make in this talk, that we have a connected identity online. So I wrote some not great code, but I just made some decisions. I didn't use any APIs. I didn't use any feeds. I didn't use any private information. There's no authentication in any of what I'm doing. This is all publicly available data that's available to any robot that's searching around the internet. So let's start on the page. This is my uh, home page. Um, and we can find some interesting stuff on this page. So if we have a look, we can see that um, there's some microformats on here. There's an XFN rel equals me. And using the uh, Ruby library MoFo, we can very easily extract this. Um, we can then uh, we can find that I've helpfully uh, put rel equals me around a whole range of stuff on my own site. So my blog, my Tumblr log, my Flickr pictures, my, uh, my Twitter presence, um, my delicious links, events on upcoming, um, and my profile on Nature Network. So all of these things are simply extractable by running a kind of file-line script. And they give us starting points to go and visit other places. So we can go and visit um, delicious. These are the stuff I was link logging a while back. Um, and using some XPath, I can find this list of tags. And that little XPath expression pulls out the contents of these tags. And this gives the, I've thresholded this page to show in a five and above. So I'm looking for stuff that I've used on a consistent basis. And you can see the stuff I'm interested in. Um, we can grab that, stash it. This person likes these things. We can move to Flickr. And Flickr gives us a whole ton of stuff. On Flickr, we've got photos, tags, people. Um, but there's not as much microformat stuff. So we have to move across to Apricot, um, the really lovely um, screen parser written by Why the Lucky Stiff. Um, so ideally, the stuff on Flickr would be microformats. There are some microformats on Flickr, but maybe not enough. Um, I would say that's probably true of most sites. I'm not picking on Flickr in particular. So here's my son. Um, and on this page, we have um, a bunch of stuff that is quite useful for us to extract. So if we run this XPath query, we can grab this number so we can know how many pictures I've taken. Um, if we run some other XPath queries um, on this lot, we can grab, whoops, all right, we can grab the contents of all of these tags. So we can find, and there's data behind these to know how often I use these tags. So rather than modeling all of the tags that I use on all the different sites, we keep them uh, tied to the, con the content that they're associated with. So these are words that describe um, photographs. 
The same word might be used to describe different things. So the context of language which I use to describe photography differs to that which I might use to describe music and use to describe wine. So red here on Flickr means one thing, but red in terms of wine means something much more deeper and richer. Um, so if we go to my profile page, um, there's a bunch of stuff on here. So again, XFN rel equals me, pulls out this stuff. So there's a link to my homepage. And in digging around in the source on Flickr.com, I discovered they've added rel equals me around this. They haven't told anybody they've done this, but they've added rel equals me. So this concretely ties my profile page to my external identity in ways that are 100% um, true. Um, and that connection is, um, when I discovered it, I felt slightly unsettled because I, I didn't have control over connecting these two pages together. The guys at Flickr were helping out and they thought, oh, microform, that's great. Stick rel equals me around that. But if you were wanting to keep separate identities or not wanting this stuff to be machine parsable, there's multiple URLs on here. And when I presented this at Xtech, quite a few people came up to me and said, oh, I, didn't know you, I didn't know Flickr were doing that. And some people said to me they were going to move their URL from here up into the main body of their profile so that it wasn't microformat and didn't concretely link the two things together. OK, so we can also get uh, all of my contacts following this link. We get to a page like this, um, some more XPath, and we can grab the contents of one of these little boxes. Um, and in here, we can get um, the number of pictures that Jeremy's taken, a link to his photographs, a link to his profile page. And if we go to his profile page, um, sorry, if we then run a, a script on this, we get a list of all of my friends, the names they use, their own name, lists of stuff. And at the bottom, we've got um, a URL that we grabbed. And where did we grab that? Well, we grabbed it from the profile page. This is Firebug at the bottom. Um, and showing the class equals URL, rel equals me, wrapped around that link that points back to Jeremy's homepage. So let's go and have a look at Jeremy's homepage. So it's the X path to get that kind of stuff. This is a fragment of Jeremy's homepage. And he has some nice rel equals me stuff on it as well. So he has rel equals me around his upcoming. So let's go and visit Jeremy and upcoming. So this is Jeremy and upcoming. And um, I haven't screen grabbed it, but Jeremy and I are friends and upcoming. And we can follow these links. Uh, pulling out uh, these XPaths gets you the contents of this. You can then follow the profile page, find out he links to me, different username, take one onion, and then we can get all the way back to my own page. So we've kind of started from GavinBell.com, gone out through a social network, collecting information the whole way along, gone back to one of my friend's pages, come back onto their social network, upcoming in this case, and come all the way back to me. And all of that is scriptable and automatable by someone who doesn't code for a living. So this stuff is out there. We're connected together, and it's really easy. So as I, as I said, we, we can build a profile of me and my friends. <clears throat> Where else can we do this? Well, we can do it on Magnolia, Vox, Dig, Corked, any of the social networks this is amenable to. So what else can we do? Well, I haven't really talked about blogs that much. And so we can go back and we can scrape um, delicious, and we can get um, this link shows the tags that uh, Delicious has determined are most appropriate in terms of the content that Tom Coates from PlasticBag.org um, writes on his blog. This is what the internet thinks Tom writes about. Um, we can grab that. So there's a thing. We can also grab these. So this is the link to Tom's most popular article uh, on Delicious. And I grab that. Um, and we can grab the number of people who've done it. And also, this links us to the, <coughs> pardon me, the, the delicious page about um, this story on uh, Tom's website. And we can find all of the tags that people describe this as. So we're starting to build up quite a rich summary picture of the kind of content that Tom writes. Um, so again, this kind of XPath stuff. So the reason for all the XPath is I was at the XTech conference and trying to encourage people to go and build stuff um, using these XPaths and using these ideas. And as I'll come on to in the later part of my talk, I'll show you why I did that. So we can do the same on Technorati. Um, we can pull off Technorati's authority. 
Um, that does that. And we can pull off um, the X path, sorry. That last X path gets these tags here. So we have, we can, using this kind of approach, we can build profiles for our friends. We can build their personal site, their tags, what people tag them as, the content that they've done, uh, how popular their content is, and how well connected uh, I am to them. This is all available from, um, this is all publicly available data. Um, it's kind of stalking, which makes me slightly uncomfortable, but it's sort of not. It's just summarizing the stuff that they're putting out there and aggregating my friends together so I can get a snapshot of, um, get the kind of snapshot that people are building through adding applications to LinkedIn, uh, sort of people aggregation. One of the, what makes me concerned about this and why I haven't actually finished this as a public application is, if I make this release as an API and a public application, you can go and screen scrape anybody. What I'd like to do is, uh, use this as OpenID enabled pages. You sign them with your OpenID, we follow the relicals me links that you have on your page, and you, it comes back with uh, a personalized list of your friends. You can't do it for anybody else using my application at least, because I think that's an um, uncomfortable feeling for me. Um, so we can do services like um, we can browse our friends by tag. So we have this application will two types of pages, profile pages showing my friends and the stuff they do, but also tag pages. So we can look across the tags, see what words are popular. We can look at rise and fall of interest amongst my friends, not the internet in general, my friends, um, and see new uh, subjects coming onto the horizon. So over the last six months, OpenID will have rocketed up. Microformats are starting to rocket up. Uh, other things will drop away. Um, so we have these layers of connection, who I'm connected to. Um, and we can see disparity as well. So this is something that uh, social networking sites, I think, correctly do. They don't show you who you've linked to but doesn't link back to you. Because it's a bit of an invidious thing to do on, within the community of a social networking site. You can see who your friends are and you can see who their friends are, but you can't see the, the set in the middle, which is the people who you think are friends who don't think you're friends. And tools like this will let you look at this in private. They'll also let you find the people who you've friended who haven't friended you. So the, the two ways that that works. So you can see people, sorry, what this won't show you is people who friended you, but you haven't friended back. You can probably do that by difference, though. Um, and we can infer from the content types of the various sites that we're looking at other things. So I, I don't know who's on Doppler, but Doppler's about tracking places that you've been to. Um, so we can use these places that I've been to to infer that we can use these as tags. So if someone visits New York a lot, we can say, Gavin knows about New York, or he knows about California. But I've only once been to Cairo, so I don't know that much about Cairo. But in terms of my friends, I'm the only person I know that's been to Cairo. So if one of my friends is looking to go to Cairo, then I'm probably the person to ask. So that you need uh, context in terms of um, whether something's visible. It's not simple thresholding on numbers. Um, OK. So I kind of put this as surfacing my friends from the sea of feeds. And the little recipe is kind of take a web page, add um, some H cards to it, make that an open ID. Um, you've got a person who you know you can verify. Find their social networks, follow the XFN links, repeat for all of their friends, come back, tags and profile pages come out of this. Um, OK, so it's a, I think it's a new kind of application. And I'm not sure what way it should be built. Um, which I'll come on to in a minute. But it's kind of peer evaluation and this kind of context sensitivity I think is important. Um, so that's rough operational model for how it might work. Um, and the email notification I think is important. Um, this is not a service that you're going to run in real time. You're going to send it off and um, maybe wait for a response on, you know, give it your instant messenger details and it'll ping you back and say, we've baked your profile for you. Um, it's a kind of notification-based service rather than a real-time processing thing. Um, okay, so I think this is a bit scary. Um, everybody gives out all this freely available data, and it's really easy to pull it all together. And if you were, uh, if you had, I was going to say lower morals, if you didn't mind about who could use this service, you could pick anybody in general, find out their friends, find out who they're connected to find out what people think of them and model anybody you fancy. And I'm sure people have written applications like this, but there aren't, don't seem to be any on, any on the internet yet. Um, 
And I wonder, is it kind of, dist is there a kind of utopian, dystopian choice here? Um, who runs these services? Say Nature, O'Reilly, Google, Amazon. Do we trust all of these companies? Well, clearly, you trust Google. Um, but would you prefer to be on, on, with a mate on a co-location box? Because then you know, you know your friend, and you trust your friend, and you've got his data. But if you're using that box as part of your identity, and it doesn't have the same kind of backup like something like Visa has, and it disappears, well, then suddenly part of your identity has disappeared. And a mate with a colo box is not that reliable. Google and Amazon, you are reliable, because you've got fantastic data centers and um, that kind of stuff. So one of the things that I think is important is the defaults and applications and awareness of what we are letting people do with their data and communicating to them clearly that um, publishing this data and putting it on the internet makes it available to search engines, makes it available. And it's not just their friends that see it. It's visible on the internet. And I think that we're not doing a good job of that. I think we're not clearly communicating to people what happens when they put their data online. Uh, I'm not sure how we do that in a relatively terse way, but I think we need to be more hand-holding with people, saying, stick this stuff up here, and everybody in the world can see it. It's obvious if you've got a blog that that's what you're doing. But I think it's less obvious in terms of social, serv social software applications. What bits are public, what bits aren't public, as we make micro changes to profiles and things like that. What data is being aggregated and shown? So most people probably don't know the, the kinds of pictures that they have and Flickr is shown. Uh, lots of people don't know that their favorites that they add to their um, Flickr profile are publicly visible. Um, so every picture that you ever favorited, if I can go to your profile, I can find all the pictures that you think are cool on Flickr. Um, so we're not doing a good job of declaring what's public and what's private. Um, so, okay, two last points. Um, the unprovenanced. At the minute, lots of people get jobs because they're on the internet. So they have a visibility, they blog about good stuff, they go to conferences, they stick their talks up, those kind of things. They are trying to get visibility. I wonder, is there a point at which um, if someone doesn't have a profile on the, on the internet, they won't get a job? It's certainly something that uh, a lot of the big uh, recruiting companies are doing. They hire interns to search for uh, Facebook and LinkedIn and MySpace profiles of new college hires to find out are they trustworthy, that kind of stuff. So uh, the kind of uh, public versus private nature of that data becomes important there. Everybody knows that on Twitter, on Facebook, on uh, MySpace, this kind of stuff, there are robots that go around and friend as many people as they can see so that they can subvert the privacy, to privacy measures um, or they can use them for spamming, that kind of stuff. We need to be more sensitive to that kind of thing. So some ideas for the future. I think identity consolidation's happened. It's not a future thing. Um, I'd like to be able to track people and not feeds. Um, I think microformats are increasingly important, but we need to sen be sensitive in their use and communicate to people what happens to their data because we've microformatted it. The Flickr example with Relic me, I think, is key in this. Um, and it's heading to kind of towards a sort of social network-based search. I don't necessarily want to ask the whole internet how to solve a particular problem. I'd love to be able to search my friends. And using services like this, where you can aggregate all of the data from your friends together, you can build these kind of small-scale, personalized search products. OK, some examples. Um, these are uh, three examples here uh, built by friends of mine who saw this talk. And in the last month, they've got it together and actually made some stuff. Um, so this is Jeremy Keith, a guy based in Brighton. Um, and he put together a little application called Hackfight based on Twitter, Delicious, Flickr, and Technorati. Uh, he screen scrapes all these different sites and determines various people's strengths based on uh, attributes. So if there are lots of pictures on Flickr, then they get a big score on perception. If they have lots of stuff on Delicious, they get a big score in terms of memory, that kind of stuff. And it's just a fun bit of, uh, <laughs> bit of nothing, really. But it's good fun. You can enter your name and it goes, all, goes away, does some screen scraping, comes back and tells you these are your scores, and then you can go and fight people. Um, it was put together in, the, in a day at the BBC Yahoo Hack Day uh, event, or last weekend. Um, this is an application that James Eilert, who works for Tango Zebra, part of DoubleClick, built. Um, this is much closer to kind of, kind of what, I, what I'm doing with ID6. Um, 
you enter your name, and it does go on screen scrape, um, Flickr, and things like that. He hasn't tied it into any form of authentication, so I can enter anybody's name here, and I'll get all this data back. I'm not sure if that's a good thing, but it's an entirely possible. Again, James built this at uh, Hack Day last weekend. And lastly, a uh, screen grab of something from Doppler. So um, this is Chris Messina's screen grab of Doppler from last night this morning, showing um, a new feature on Doppler. Um, so Chris worked with Twitter um, to add micro uh, HCAR microformats to Twitter six weeks, a month back. Um, Matt Biddle from Doppler um, imports these H cards, and you can mark any one of these people and add them to your Doppler social network. I think that's the first example of people doing social network, sort of portable social network type work. I, I'm, I, that's the first I've seen anyway. Um, so I'm really pleased to see lots of this stuff being built in the last month. Um, and there's three kind of closing themes, which I think you can probably guess. So I think we need better guidelines for building web applications. Um, we need to do a better job of communicating to our users what we're doing, what this data is available, how this data is available, and what they can hide. We probably need finer grained privacy control. Uh, within Nature Network, one of the things we're looking at is doing, uh, no one can see this, my friends can see it, my friends and contacts, anybody who adds me to their social network, and everybody in the world. That kind of five levels, I think, works quite well across most social networking applications. That's quite closely tied to the idea of privacy. Um, we're making lots of data available on the, on the internet. Um, and I think there are privacy concerns around this. Certainly Sue Sharman, uh, who's speaking next week, um, she works for the Open Rights Group in the UK. And when I give, gave her this presentation, she was really quite, uh, not upset, but surprised that this was as easy as this is. And lastly, I think we should be looking at tools to let us manage people and not feeds. Um, people are what we care about. The data they generate is interesting, but we care about people. If we've decided to add someone to our social network, if we decide to add them to multiple social networks, then maybe our feed reading tools should kind of prioritize their material, or maybe add in the feeds on the social networks because it knows who they are. We kind of need to integrate our different applications together so that we're modeling friendship relationships. And we can use tools like Google and Yahoo search engines to find stuff that we have no context with, but we can use tools like this to go and find our friends to ask them something. OK. Thank you very much. Oops. So, um, any questions? Do you have any thoughts or just comments on the, the general issues of like, changing the dynamic of the relationship once you've got it set up? And here, I'm particularly thinking about disconnecting the relationship. Typically, when you start, you've got some kind of handshake protocol going on. But, like, let's say I establish a relationship with you, but somewhere over time we're falling out, or you decide you don't like me and you want to have a divorce, basically, something mm -hmm. like that. I just wonder if you have any thoughts on so how these kind of uh, yeah. So this kind of people management application I've been talking about. Um, I think it probably should update itself. Uh, it's not a once-off scan of the internet to say these are my friends. Um, the cycle it updates that on. Um, Part of the reason I haven't built this application is because I'm worried about the bandwidth bill that I'd rack up with my uh, colo provider. Um, should it subscribe to all the feeds that this person has? Um, should it poll sites on a daily basis to see other changes in terms of friendship? Um, when I rewrite this, um, I'm going to use the APIs that various people have. I'm going to use the Flickr API, Delicious API, that kind of stuff. Um, do they have notification services within those APIs to tell me if? Uh, who's joined and who's left my social network. Can I get a private password protected feed that says, this person joined and this person left your network? Um, some of the social networking applications out there show you this kind of stuff. Um, it's the kind of thing that Facebook does. Facebook even tells you about your, your friends who've made friends with people new who you don't know. Um, so I think, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what kind of application this is. So as you can see, I've got this idea of id6.com where I'm going to hopefully build something. Um, but it might work equally well as a kind of as an exchange plugin. Maybe it's a maybe it's part of Gmail. Um, where this tool is best cited, uh, I'm not sure. And how often it updates itself, um, I'm not sure. Uh, one of the other kind of things I'm really interested in at the minute is environmental concerns. If this thing's needlessly pulling down 
uh, megabytes worth of feeds every day, then that's not very really good for the environment. That data has to be shifted around. It costs electricity to shift that data around. What's the minimum amount of data that this needs to pull across to build an accurate picture of my friends? So uh, thank you. It's a good question. Um, anybody else? No? OK. Well, thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>